Uh, in our Elephants in the Room series, we know that we are addressing a lot of different topics and a, uh, a 30 minute preach on a Sunday can only cover so much. We usually get a lot of questions around, well, you covered this, but here's everything else that you didn't cover, which is gonna be the case with a 30 minute time slot. So we're doing an Elephants in the Room podcast series. We film it every Monday morning. Uh, just a few people having a conversation around the preach that happened on a Sunday to give you some more context into around it. So in your life groups or on your way to work, things like that. If you want some different aspects, a rehash of the preach that was, download the City Point app. And uh, on that, you'll see Elephants in the Room podcast. Uh, it's uh, a good listen. Um, following on from Pastor, Ma- Pastor Mike's preach last week around cancel culture, I want to, and I really love the way Pastor Mike preaches. He's, it's Preaching and and teaching from the Word of God is not just about tickling your intellectual curiosity around spiritual things. It's not just around, hey, teach me something I don't know so I can become smarter or more intellectual around the things of God. That's not the goal of preaching. One of the goals of preaching is a discerning of the times, which I believe this series does very well. A discerning of the times that we are in, that the Word of God can be a guide and a practical resource to navigate the tricky seasons that we have through the Holy Spirit, through the divine inspiration of the Bible that we should be able to discern the times that we're in and how to live in a way that glorifies God, expands His kingdom and allows us to be more like His Son. Cancel culture was a great avenue into that and I wanna build on that a little bit by addressing a relational dynamic that I see uh, all throughout history, all in our society, across different levels of society, whether it be in your relationship with God, your relationship with one other person, our relationship as a society or even nationally, we see this. And uh, even, even singing this morning and, and Pastor Mike on lead, he shared this thing around that God is the turnaround King. And I wanna talk about this simple concept, I'll call it here, uh, the comeback. Like everything changes when you come back to something. Really simple concept. I wanna explain a bit more about this, but for example, you go on a first date with somebody you're not married, okay? You don't get to do any dating anymore if you're married. But if you, if you go on a first date with someone, the first date is not really where the relationship starts. You can suss, every the first date's a sussing of each other. But if you commit to a second date, that's when the relationship starts. There's this going away, assessing if there's anything there, do we wanna have a go at this? And coming back together. And in the second date there, there's like, all right, there's something more here. We gelled, there's something else. When you come back, it's almost like there is a bit more of a, a commitment to it. That's where everything kind of starts. And on an individual level, we see this kind of separation and coming together all the way through the Bible. On an individual level, we see the prodigal son. He's with his father. He asks his father for the inheritance and there's a separation. He wastes all his inheritance and he comes back to his father, right? Right? Or the woman at the well on a societal level meets Jesus, there's a separation, go their separate ways and then she brings a whole town back to Jesus to experience Him and they're changed. Or we look at the patterns of Israel in the Old Testament, they were with God, God's people, then pick your idol of the week for Israel, a golden calf, whatever it may be, separate from God, God needs to rescue them and bring Him back. There's this cycle of we're with God and then we're without and then we're back. They're together, separate, together. It's a really basic relational pattern, but I think it explains a lot and especially about the mistrust and suspicion in our current society. That what we are seeing now in our cultural moment is a diminishing of trust circles around your life. Where maybe 10 years ago, your trust circle would have been much bigger. I trust my parents or my family, or I trust what the newspaper tells me. But now, with so much information out there, with more conspiracy theories than ever, people's trust circles have gone from wider and narrowly shrunk down to perhaps just yourself. Or maybe just the echo chamber of people who have the same opinion around a really important concept as you do. And your trust circles and trust circles have degraded. And as trust degrades, society breaks down. And so we have a society of suspicion. And that has been caused around many different things. But this is not a, and this pattern of breaking and coming together in it is is not a a new pattern. I want to look at what the Bible says about this and, and why these trust issues 
have happened in our society and what part the redemptive collective, the church, can play in it. Because it is degraded and it does bring division in our society. And right now in our society, you'll see it is divided. Pick an issue. There's, it's so polarised on every single issue. In the Bible, I'm going to look at Peter and Jesus and their relationship. Because Peter and Jesus had a relationship that was trusting. We see in one, in one aspect that Jesus is preaching to the crowds and He says, hey, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you cannot follow me. And everyone's like, well, we're out. I'm not doing that. And then he turns to the disciples, well, what about you? And they say, where else would we go? You have the waters of eternal life. Like I trust you with my eternity. And that was Peter saying that he trusted God. But this relational dynamic of together, apart, absent and present, that was in his life. Look at this in Matthew 16. It says this, look at how quickly this switches in Peter. This is someone who trusts God. Peter was one of Jesus' three. So there was the multitudes, then there was the 12, and then there was three. He was tight. This is besties. This is family. And Jesus asking them who they think he is. Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. That is the correct answer. Jesus responded, blessed are you, Simon Peter, because flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my father in heaven. How that's the biggest compliment he could have received. You didn't get this, you, you got it from God. You must, you must be in tune with God. My Father has shown this to you. We are together. I also say to you, you are Peter and on this rock I'll build my church. Verse 21, from then on Jesus began to point out to His disciples that it was necessary for Him to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. He's gonna be killed, raised on the third day. Peter took Him aside and began to rebuke Him. Oh no, Lord, this will never happen to you. Jesus turned to Him and told Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me because you're not thinking about God's concerns, about humans' concerns. There's this closeness and then a distance. You're blessed. You're Satan. We're together. We're apart. You get this? There's this dynamic to and from, to and from. It's this really basic dynamic relational principle, but it's gathered a lot of uh, study and even been um, a focus of many leadership Summits and there's a psychiatrist named Kurt Thompson who's done a lot of work on this. He, he says he draws from the attachment theory and interpersonal neurobiology of which I didn't go into the study of. I am not a psychiatrist, but he asserts that this is the basic relational dynamic of any, of all and any healthy relationships. And Kurt Thompson, he just calls it rupture and repair. There's a rupture in a relationship and then there is a repair of that same relationship. And we can put whatever language we want around it. I'm just gonna use his because we don't need to reinvent the wheel, but it's describing this pattern that happens on an individual level like Jesus and Peter. It also happens on a societal level and a national level in our society. There's a rupture, like we see, and then there's a repair. But Kurt Thompson's um, assertion on it is that trust cannot be built in any kind of relationship without it, that it must occur a rupture and a repair. We look at Peter's life a little bit more in Matthew 26, verses 69 to 75. This is straight after uh, the Last Supper. The Last Supper, it's that Jesus and his, his um, best friends, the 12 disciples, and he says to Peter, oh, Peter says, I will never, you know, never forsake you, Jesus. And Jesus says, well, actually, Peter, by the time the uh, rooster crows tomorrow morning, you're gonna do it three times. Peter's like, no way, not gonna happen. And then we see this verse and watch this play out in Matthew 26. Peter was sitting outside the courtyard. Jesus had just been arrested. A servant girl approached him, just someone of the community, not someone even of high status. You were with Jesus the Galilean as well, but he denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about. One rupture. And then he he went out, he'd gone. When he'd gone out to the gateway, another woman saw him and told those who were there, this man was with Jesus the Nazarene. And again, he denied it with an oath. I don't know the man. A second rupture in the relationship. And after a little while, those who were standing there approached and said to Peter, you really are one of them since even your accent gives them away. And he started to curse and swear with an oath. I don't know the man. Immediately the rooster crowed and Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken before the rooster crows. You'll deny me three times. And he went outside and wept 
bitterly. This is the last time, another account of it says in a different gospel that Jesus looked at him at the third time, the same time the rooster crowed. And that was the last time they had eyes before Jesus was, was crucified. Can you imagine your best friend or your, someone so close to you, your saviour goes to that and the last thing they see of you is you betraying them completely. What a rupture to the relationship. You can imagine Jesus being like, I don't want anything to do with that person. I, I cannot trust Peter, right? But we know that's not the end of Jesus' story. And if you haven't read the Bible, this is a spoiler, but Jesus rises from the dead. And um, John 21 is after this has happened. After this, Jesus revealed Himself again to His disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed Himself in this way. Simon Peter, Nathaniel, Zebedee's sons and two of His other disciples were together. I'm going fishing, Peter said. Well, we're coming with you, they told him. They went out, they got into the boat and that night they caught nothing. When daybreak came, Jesus stood on the shore. Disciples did not know it was him. Friends, Jesus called, you don't have any fish, do you? No, they answered. Well, cast the the net onto the right side of the boat, he told them, and you'll find some. So they did and they were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish. A miracle that he did with them in their early days and afterwards they would have known it was him. So they're the disciple, the one that Jesus loved, which was John, also the person who just wrote the one that Jesus loved, said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he tied his clothing around him and he jumped into the sea and he swam to the shore, about a hundred yards away. The other disciples came in the boat. When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs, he told him. That's one. Second time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Well, shepherd my sheep, he told him, two. He asked him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved that he asked him the third time, like, do you not believe me that I love you? Simon, son of John, do you love me? Do you? He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep, Jesus said. Three times Peter denied Jesus. There was three ruptures to the relationship. And then three times we see Jesus come back into the relationship and repair it. Rupture, repair, rupture, repair. And even off that, it doesn't matter how far you feel like you're from God right now. It doesn't matter how many wrongs you feel like you've done by God, how much sin you have done against God. God is only just one moment from coming up on your shore and saying, I can repair this relationship. There is no depth, no height, no angel, no demon, no principality, no power that can separate you from the love of God. We have a God of the turnaround, the God of the comeback, the God who can repair any ruptured Relationship, And here we see with Peter, Jesus comes back and a relationship that was ruptured has now been repaired. It's this process, this rupture and this repair that outworked on different levels that fosters trust in any relationship. I'm gonna look, up, look at this on three levels, rupture and repair. The first one, the most basic one is, is absence and presence. Physical, you're there and then you're not. And we have a two-year-old and anyone that's a parent in this place knows that when kids are really young, really young, there's a moment where, you know, you go out of the room for a moment and the kid loses the plot. Because in their development stages, in that moment, they don't know if you're coming back. So you leave the kid and they think they're abandoned and they're crying and then you come back and like, oh, okay, it's okay again. And then mum or dad leave the room again and there's that same issue. Oh no, they're gone. And it takes this process, this being, at, being present with them and then absent from them and back present again for the child to realise, oh, they're coming back. I can trust that mum and dad are going to return. It's the most basic element of absence and presence. But this can be done on a whole range of different aspects. And in, in this COVID season, in, with the presence of social media, this happens in our relationships and our friendships as well. That you don't see somebody for a while and they start posting random things or you look at their feed on social media because that's the only you know, insight into their life that you have. And like, oh, what are they doing? That's, that's a bit weird for them to do or that's a random decision for them to make. Uh, one of my best mates, his name is uh, Chris Borrell and a few years ago he moved up to Cairns, went up to the Tablelands and um, I've known him since I was four. 
And so we've been together a long time. We know each other really well. And he went up there to spend some time with his, his wife's family. And I remember one day him telling me, hey, we're, we're gonna buy a horse ranch. And then I'm thinking like, what's going on there that he would just go down that route? Because I only see him once or twice a year, but then when he does come down, you see him again and those things around like, what's, what's the decision making around that? When you're with somebody again, it humanises them again. You're like, oh, he's the same person he's always been. The same thing happens with our friends. We haven't seen them for a while and we can be like, what's them going on? But they, you come into their world again and it humanises them again. And in our world, we get divided by opinions on different things. We live in a divided world. Uh, and Pastor Mike spoke in it last week around people creating echo chambers around big issues in their world. We have these people and they all believe the same thing. And these people who believe a different thing and they're mudslinging at each other. And when any of the big issues come up and someone DMs me on social media or, or slams us for something, the first thing I do is be like, hey, great, come in for a coffee. Let's, let's talk it out. About 1%, if that, of people want to actually do that. Because a lot of people, they can just throw opinions and because if you can dehumanise the other person if their opinion doesn't match up with you online. But when you come into that presence again, when you're in the same place, I'm a human again, I'm just a person. And every time you do that, you can have a great dialogue around things, a meaningful chat around things. And so when there's all these mudslinging online, it can just be this part where there hasn't been this absence presence and therefore no trust has been built up in the relationship. It's only absence without the presence. And that leads to a breakdown of trust and therefore a breakdown of healthy relationship. Secondly, you go to another level, there's absence and presence. The next one is failure and recovery. And failure, failure can happen and often does without anybody being at fault. It's no one's fault. It can just be because of circumstances, vulnerabilities of society or even organisations. It's how do we respond when failure occurs? There was this article in the Harvard Business Review and uh, it was based on the study of, mini, of middle managers at this really large company. Why some middle managers went on to succeed and others got stuck. And what made the difference, the authors found, was not that some failed and some didn't. Every single one of them failed, but how they failed. It uses this language, successful managers failed quickly, boldly and loudly. Unsuccessful ones failed slowly, timidly and quietly. And that there was an owning of the failure which allowed a recovery to take place. And failure and recovery, the cycle builds resilience. Yesterday, I went to the park with my daughter. Actually, she took me to the park, if we're honest. And um, she, she loves the swing. Every time I'm on there, higher, 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 it seems to be her favourite word. And there was someone else on the swing that has the back on it that supports her in. And she loves going on the big girl swing. So one, just no back on it, just there. She's, she's two and four months or something. And uh, she sat on there and she's holding on, pushing higher, higher. So we're pushing higher. And uh, she likes to boundary test at the moment, you know, as they do. So maybe you say one thing and they like to do the other. Um, and she's hanging on and I'm saying, hold on, darling, make sure you hold on, we're going higher. And then she goes like this, let go, look back at me when she's up at her height. Does this epic backflip at head height and just bang on the sand, face and belly and her, her face is full of sand, nose is full of sand, mouth is full of sand and she's screaming. And I'm there, by the time she hits the ground, I rush over and um, there's another uh, dad beside me pushing his kid and he's kind of like in shock as well. We go over to the, the fountain. It was something we should have caught on video, it would have, would have gone viral, but we went over to the bubbler and we're washing her face out and she's still got sand around her nose, most of it's gone around her mouth and she's still crying and she just takes off. And I chase her again like, oh, okay, what are we, what are we doing? Runs back to the exact same swing he tries to jump on her and starts yelling, higher, higher, higher. And so I start pushing her and the dad next to me, his words were, what the hell, man? <laughs> and so I'm pushing her higher and higher again. And half of me is like, do I let her go back on the swing? Like I, I couldn't stop her at this point. And so, and the dad next to me is like, please, please hold on, sweetie. And so she's, <laughs> and I'm pushing her. And, and it came at the perfect time for this, this sermon illustration. <laughs> An epic failure. <laughs> followed by a recovery builds resilience. If, if you want no resilience in the next generation, 
Don't let them fail at anything and don't let them go back and try again at things they've failed. That's, that's, or, or don't give them separations in competitions. Make sure no one feels like they've failed ever. That's how you build no resilience in the people. You need to be able to fail. You can't play it so safe in your life that you're not gonna fail. Do something this year that when you fail, it could be dramatic. <laughs> and in this last season of, of COVID and We've all had this kind of dramatic failure, whether it be unmet expectations, something that you planned that didn't come to pass. And now in this season, most of us have done some recovery and know that if we had to go through it again, we'd be okay. We can do that. We've been through that. There is a resilience and that happens relationally as well. The next level, absence, presence, failure, recovery. The next level is sin and forgiveness that at the, fault, at the um, failure level, it might not be anyone's fault, but not just failure, there is times where it is people's fault. There's broken promises, there's betrayal, there's hurts, there's lies, there's deceptions. And these ruptures too are all part of our lives. Like Peter denying Jesus three times, that is his fault. There is fault. This happens in your family, they happen in your friends, they happen on society from different levels from us to government, from government to us and all different levels. But let me just talk about in the context of a church for a moment and you can extrapolate it to the rest of your worlds. In in any room you walk into, in any situation where there is a relationship, fault or sin will be there. And uh, City Point Brisbane is, is no exception. You walk into this place and you're in a room full of bright and beautiful people and we are, we're bright and beautiful people but it's not just that here because we are, imperfect people, justified by a perfect God, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit, still growing and moving forward into Christ's likeness, then fault and sin and mistakes are made within our community all the time. And not only are you blessings to each other, you are also threats and dangers because you can hurt each other. That's what a community is. And we live in a world where sin isn't just personal, but it's also structural. That without even wishing to it, we find ourselves participating in different random structural exploitation all the time. There's some people that are very aware of how different clothing are made and they'll avoid different brands and some don't care. And there's all these structures that are set up and just being in the world means we are involved and participate in random exploitations we may or may not be aware of. And we can ignore that in any part of our community. We can ignore the faults and sins done against each other. It's a big church, like if someone says something to you and hurts you over here, next week you can sit over there and you can avoid it completely. You don't go to the life group anymore. or You can avoid these things. But to avoid them does damage. And we don't wanna be like the religious people who passed on the other side of the road in the Good Samaritan story, avoiding the need there, when in this cycle of sin and forgiveness is how trust and unity is built in a community. Sin is a type of practical atheism. Atheism is saying God's not there. Sin is a type of practical atheism. It's saying that in this decision or this thought that I'm making, I don't care if God's there or not, I know what's right for me. I'm not even gonna consult Him in it. And there's no bigger rupture to a relationship than that. There's no bigger rupture to a marriage than me not considering at all what Ruthie would want of me or talking to her or acknowledging her, pretending like she doesn't exist. That ruptures a relationship. And sin is like that, practical atheism that ruptures our relationship with God. It ruptures our relationship with other people because we say things we shouldn't have said or we don't say things the Holy Spirit prompts us to say. We do things that bring destruction or we don't do things that could have brought someone life. All these different things in our community that could bring fault. And so we need to practice confrontation, telling the truth in love. We need to practice repentance, the turning around, the forgiveness. We need to be, I think Pastor Mike put it this way last week, merchants of mercy. A merchant of mercy, to extend mercy is to give someone mercy when it's not deserved. Because if if you gave mercy only when it is deserved, that's just justice. Mercy is only mercy when it's not deserved. And we need to be merchants of mercy to everyone else in our church. Matthew 7, 1 to 5 says this, do not judge so that you won't be judged. For you will be judged by the same standard with which you judge others and measured by the same measure you use. Why do you look at the splinter in your brother's eye but don't notice the beam of wood in your own? 
How can you say to your brother, let me take the splinter out of your eye and look, there's a beam of wood in your own. Hypocrite. First take the beam of wood out of your own eye, then you'll see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother's eye. Forgiveness and repentance. We need to see the areas that we still suck at or we've hurt people in. We need to say sorry for them. And that's how trust can be built again. Otherwise, it's just avoidance and breeds division and divisiveness. And I know some of your stories and people here and you may have been hurt by people in this room or maybe you've been hurt by people that represent the church, but I'm so proud that you, you keep coming back. There's power in just staying the course and keeping coming. Do you see the, the power of this? And the Gospel is this in a nutshell, that humanity was ruptured and then it was repaired. This is redemptive practice if you just keep turning up to things. If you keep your presence in people's lives, that is a redemptive practice. That's trust building. That's commitment to the Gospel. That's transformative power. Because when you come back after a rupture, it changes everything by breathing life into what was broken. Rupture and repair. Absence, presence, failure, recovery, sin and forgiveness. It's how it all works. But let's look at the cultural moment that we are in. The story of our cultural moment is one of rupture without repair. We have an absence from each other. And yes, this was enhanced by the pandemic, but it was already in motion in the Western technological world. This has bred mistrust and suspicion. In a technological world, we have, and Andy Crouch says this really well, we have moved away from personal to personalised. That instead of in our relationships where we have this presence together and an absence and coming back to the presence, we prefer to have a personalised, like our Spotify on our phone saying, hey, here are some songs we think you will like today, Chris. My phone doesn't know me. It's an algorithm just spitting out what I've already listened to or things like that. But here it makes me feel like it knows me. And that presence, that personal touch needs to come from our human relationships, not what technology is, is doing. And technology does that. So like Pastor Mike said last week, you've got to be careful for what gratification you're getting from it. Otherwise, we will constantly have an absence without the presence and we won't trust people in our world. Two, we've had a failure of systems that promise to keep us safe and protect us. And this can be across a wide range of things we have and it doesn't matter where you stand on different issues like vaccine, but if you did do it or then you didn't do it, but then you couldn't work and a system that was supposed to be for the good of our people, no system is perfect. It's always gonna let someone down. There's gonna be a failure of systems that were in place to protect us. And then on any polarising issue that we have in our society, there has been mistreatment from both sides without repentance or repair, regardless of which side you're on on different issues. There's, we live in a mudslinging society. It's easy to write things online and cast stones. But if there's no repentance or repair, all that's going to bring is division. And because people are defined by their opinion on certain topics, you get dehumanised by people that do different ones. And the words are so strong around it. Disgusting, abhorrent. It's like, what else can I say that dehumanises them even more? Ruptures in relationships are fine. Ruptures with governments, societal levels. All good, that's going to happen. But in times past, there's been a road to repair. And in our cultural moment, we've substituted repair for replacing things or retreating. Like when you, we've been, and we've been bred to do this. My phone's three years old. It's got a bit of an issue. I'm just going to replace it. Sometimes we do that with relationships or we just retreat from something that's caused us hurt. One of the big ones Andy Crouch talks about is that there's this stage in parenting life whereas the early years, the kids love you. Aurora's always needing mum and dad and that's lovely. Apparently when they get to their teenage years, they're not so affectionate. And so in the teenage years, this, this bipolar situation comes in where one party, they love you, but the other part, they, they need space. Get away from me, mum and dad. And what we're seeing in this technological age and what uh, the commentators are seeing on it is that instead of the parents investing and embracing this presence absence with their teenager, they replace it with a device that never says no, that never says we don't need you, that's always there for them in that moment. And so just a bit of advice as someone who's never lived that out at all, and that we will do it, you just got to make sure we are embracing this absence and presence for the betterment of our kids. 
So people's trust circles start out here and they're getting narrower and narrower and the things you were trusted and the conspiracy theories make you go tighter and tighter because who can we really trust anymore to a point where it might just be you in your trust circle or you might have issues trusting God due to unanswered prayer or these many things or you've just reduced it down to your echo chamber of people who have the same viewpoint about some issue. Rupture without repair is leading to the breakdown and division of our society. I'll put this on the screen behind me. Building trust through rupture and repair is the most basic work of a human being. Restoring trust that has been ruptured without repair is our most basic work as a redemptive community of Christ. This is what, this is our road back. This is what we must be involved in. Notice when Peter denies Jesus three times, it's not Peter that runs back to Jesus. It's Jesus that stands on the shore of Peter's life and says, hey, come in, I'm here. Like the person that was hurt turns up for the person who did the hurting. In all these situations, there needs to be someone that's bigger. That's someone that takes the high ground. That's someone that makes the first move. Someone has to have a bigger heart. Someone has to have a bigger perspective. And that always falls on the church and Christians to do. And so we need to have a trust first in here as a church and then one from that place of security, one that we can take to the world. And I just want to put this slide up as a bit of a way that we can trust each other in the church as people who have so many divided opinions on things. So trust in the church, I think, is formed like this. In essentials, we are unified. Trust in the church. In the essentials, we have unity. Unity in Christ is not that we agree on all things. We are not robots. It is that we agree around the core issues of our traditional faith, that the God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is a Trinitarian God, that Jesus died, was buried, and was resurrected, that I can have new life, that one day I'll be resurrected with Him, that baptism is important, that communion is important. These are core things to the faith, right? We can agree on those. There's a whole bunch of non-essential things as well. Things very important, require conversation to get to the bottom of, but people will disagree. New earth versus old earth. Did God use evolution, but it was still Him creating us through it? You know, issues that matter and we can talk about, but in non-essentials, grace. In essentials, hold it tight. In non-essentials, grace. Have a liberty. But in all things, love. The Bible says they will know us by our love for one another, not because we hug each other more, not because we you know, comment on each other's social media more, oh, look, they love each other, but because in issues that would bring division in our society, they somehow cause unity in the church. They will know us by our love for one another, that even when we are divided on unpopular opinions, we still can love one another. The brokenness, distrust and degradation we are experiencing will not be repaired by us being right. Renewal will come with us being sacrificially present, sacrificially committed to recovery and sacrificially committed to repentance. Keep showing up for people. Even when they, when they break your trust, when, they, when you lose hope in them, when they stand you up again, keep showing up for people. It builds trust. It builds relationship. Keep showing up for church. Your trust in God is dependent on this absence and presence relationship with the body of Christ. Keep showing up. Be committed to repentance. Be committed to this daily routine of being like, maybe maybe I don't have it all. When do we become too holy for repentance? Do we have such a high opinion of ourselves that we no longer think we need to change? And what I've noticed is that people who spend time in the presence of God repent more. Recently, we bought blinds for our house and in the testing, they send different shades of white for your choice. And one, I was looking at, yeah, that's, that's perfectly white. And then I held up another piece against it and this one looks completely grey. And that's how I find our lives are when we come into the presence of God. When we look at ourselves, we're like, we're doing all right. But when you come into the presence of God of someone so perfect and so holy and so powerful, It reveals something in you that you need to change. Isaiah chapter six says this. Isaiah was like the celebrity prophet of the time. He was God's mouthpiece to the nation and he was already doing that. But in this year, the king that Isaiah died, he saw the Lord seated on high and a lofty throne and the hem of his robe filled the temple. And he said, woe is me, I am ruined because I'm a man of unclean lips. 
He came in there proud and he was humbled in the presence of God. I live among people of unclean lips because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of armies. When you see the goodness of God, it leads you to repentance. It shows the areas of your life that you need to change and grow in. That's what sanctification is. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life. To get rid of this sin and bring a repentance and forgiveness. That's what we need to do as a community. We have to be people who repair, who build bridges back from rupture. And the basic level, it starts with just keep showing up for people. Be a presence after absence. Don't lose hope for people. Church is important. Be committed to repentance. Be committed to change for Him. And the whole gospel story is a story of rupture and repair. It's this whole moment, like it's a big ask. You, the church, you have to be the bigger person. You have to be the bigger person in your workplace. And that's a big ask of anyone to do. Where do you get the power? Where do you get the conviction? Where do you get the courage to do that, to be the one that builds the bridge back? And the whole story of the gospel is one of rupture and repair that we were with God at the start, humanity in the garden. And because of sin, we ruptured that. Because of that, we broke our relationship with God and there's this, this absence from Him again. And the only way, the only way that that ruptured relationship with God could become repaired again was not by our doing, but by Christ's doing. Ephesians 2, 12 to 17 says this, At that time you were without Christ, excluded from the citizenship of Israel, foreigners to the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We talked about that in communion today, the blood of Christ, the power of the blood. For He is our peace who made both groups one and tore down the dividing walls of hostility. That's what we do as Christians. We're, we're peace bringers. We, we tear down walls of hostility. In His flesh, He made no effect for law consistent of commands and expressed in regulations so that He might create in Himself one new man from the two, resulting in peace. He did this so that He might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross by which He put hostility to death. He came, He proclaimed the good news of peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. Only in Christ, He, just like He showed up on the, on the beach to repair His relationship with Peter. And at any given moment, Jesus is standing on the shore of your life and saying, hey, let's repair these ruptures again. With you in terms of your spirituality, your faith on a whole, but also every day. And He wants to do that with everybody, just repairing the ruptures of your life. Where do we get the courage to do it? It's because Jesus has done that for you. He came and stood on the shore of your life and said, I know you've rejected me. I know you've walked away, but will you come in? Will you come in and repair this relationship with me? Let me pray as we close our eyes today. God, I thank You that You are a repairing God, that You are so faithful to humanity that you, even though you were wronged, you still come and, and step out and repair your relationship with us. When we are absent, you are present. When we fail, you make a way for recovery. When we sin against you and others, you make a way for forgiveness through repentance. Can we embrace this, Lord God, that we can bring trust back into our society that can grow and flourish and be all that you meant it to be? And God, here today for people who who feel like there's ruptures in their relationship with You. They feel like there's distances because of faults or failures or absenteeism or, or whatever it may be. There's people who feel like there's ruptures in their relationship with You. And if you are like that today, I'd love to pray with you in just a moment to know who I'm praying for. I'm just gonna count to three and on three, I'd love you to raise your hand so we can pray together because we have a God who repairs every rupture who's present even when we're absent. And if you need God to repair some ruptures in your relationship with Him, you need to get right with Him today. One, you're here today for this reason, not just to hear a message, but to meet God, to become like into a real relationship with Him. That's what it's about. Two, it doesn't matter your faults, your failures, your sin, your shame, He knows it all, but He's still there, still on the edge of your life saying, come in. Eat with me. Let me repair the damage that has been done. So if you have ruptures in your life today, you need to make a decision to have that repaired 
Three, I'd love you to put up your hand so I can pray with you. Thank you, I see that hand. Thank you, I see that hand. Thank you, I see that hand. Anyone else today? Thank you, I see that hand. God, I thank you for the hands that went up that I saw and maybe the ones that I didn't see, but that doesn't matter because you saw their heart. The intention of their heart was to connect with you again, just like Peter jumped off the boat to be back with you. They've, they've made a leap today. I jump back in saying they don't want these ruptures in their relationship with You. God, will You come in, Holy Spirit, will You come into their life and repair any damage that's there, any, any absences, any failures make a road for recovery, any sin will You forgive. They can experience Your presence and experience Your closeness. Again, I thank You for those decisions in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Put our hands together for those decisions.